um, GPL enforcement or GPL compliance. Uh, and uh, with the experience of doing that for 25 years, and I'm, I'm really, really happy to introduce you Bradley Kuhn, who is one of the very few, if not the only person on this planet who has this experience of doing this GPL work for 25 years. So I'm all thrilled to listen to what he has to say. Give him a very warm welcome. Bradley Kuhn, please. Thank you. So I think the most important thing to remember about my talk is not what I'm going to say but how important this event is. This event's run by a community of volunteers. It is the most important free software event in the world every year. It has the most attendees, and it is non-commercial, community-oriented, and fair and friendly. And <laughs> there are only three or four events like that left in our community because they've been taken over uh, by other interests. Uh, and this is by far the largest. So that's the most important thing I have to say. You can all leave now. Um, my slides are online. Uh, anything that's in blue is a link. So feel free to follow along. And when you get bored, just click through the links and read those instead. I've done a lot of talks about copyleft, as most of you probably know. I see people out there who have seen a lot of them. I work for an organization called the Software Freedom Conservancy. We do a lot of different things. We spend a lot of different time on things that are not license enforcement or anything to do with licenses. My colleagues stayed up to 4 AM, this time zone, to get a bunch of logistics done for a conference for one of our projects last night while I was working on this talk. I spent some of the afternoon working on this talk, but also importing our donation system and fixing it. But people always want to hear about copyleft, so I tend to talk about that more than any other topic that we do. I suppose you don't want to hear about uh, how our PayPal imports Perl script works. Yes, it's written in Perl, I'm sorry. Um, so I think, most importantly, free software developers need to know the whole story of what's going on. There are a lot of things happening in the politics of copyleft. And my colleague, Karen Sandler, whom I work with, keeps telling me not to use the word politics. But there are lots of politics. So I'm not the type of person that's going to cover up what things really are. And most of you don't know what is going on with those politics. Fortunately, because I work for a charity, not a company, not a trade association, I have a tremendous amount of freedom. It's the best job I've ever had. I hope to retire from it someday. And I have not only the freedom, but an obligation as an employee of a charity to really tell you what the real story is, at least from our point of view. In fact, Conservancy, I think, is even more transparent than most charities. And we operate, I think, as the most transparent organization in the open source and free software community by far. Those of you who have seen my talks before know that I like to put stuff about philosophers up on my slides. Um, I like first principles. I like the idea of applying the humanities to this world of science. I think interdisciplinary thought is important. I'm capable of laughing at it as well. But I really cared about ideas and morality and right and wrong and doing good in the world. So I want to start out by giving the brief tale of how I ended up caring so much about copyleft. I went to what we call in the US a liberal arts university. Uh, I was primarily studying computer science, but we had excessive requirements, some thought, in going to philosophy and literature courses. But I was a geek, of course, and I had never owned my own computer. I, I know that sounds bizarre uh, to the younger people in the audience, but until I got to college, I never owned my computer and uh, my own computer, so I wanted to buy one. So I bought something that looked a lot like this. Um, I actually got it from Sager. I could not find any picture of 1992-era Sager laptops. So this is, uh, I think, a Toshiba model. But it looked a lot like that. Uh, I couldn't find any personal pictures of it. Well, apparently, I didn't like take photos of my computer like I do with my dogs now. So there aren't any photos of that computer, I don't think. 
Um, but I got it, and um, it was well known around campus. Uh, my, my, one of my literature professors, uh, whom I liked, I went back to see him uh, in the early 2000s. I had him for three classes. I didn't expect him to remember me. He said, of course I remember you. You were the first person to ever bring a laptop to one of my classes. Now they all bring those things. <laughs> and now I got it this way. I didn't have internet access. You used to buy this magazine. It was called The Computer Shopper. It was giant. It was this thick. It was like $6.50, which was a pretty expensive magazine in 1992. And you'd page through it, and you look at all the computers for sale, and you'd use this thing called a telephone. And I'm not talking about like that, that device you have in your pocket now. This was a thing connected to a twisted pair line, to a central office, that sort of stuff. And you call them up, and you'd order a computer, and they'd send it to you. Now, I had already been using Unix. I had access to a Unix system at work. Um, unfortunately, at that point, I only had access to a VMS system at school. But I knew Unix was the best operating system available. And I needed to find one for my little Sager laptop there. And I, well, it wasn't so little. It was like 35 pounds. I don't know how much that is in kilos. It was, it was heavy. That's why I think every laptop I've had is like, I'm, I'm free rolling, because every laptop I've ever had is lighter than that one ever since then. So I, I carried around 35 pounds, pounds around campus. What's the big deal? Um, so I started reading this news group, because I had used Net Access, but not Internet Access. So I, I was reading Comp OS Minix and read this, uh, well, in what Usenet was called real time. It was a few days after it was posted, because it took that long for the message to get to you. But a few days after it was posted, I read it. Because I was reading Comp OS Minix to see if I could get Minix running on that Sager PC, and then found out that, hey, this Linux thing might be coming along. When I get my Sager PC, I can install this Linux thing. And one of the things that was very interesting to me was that word. That's still very interesting to me. Because for me, software was going to be a profession, but it was also going to be a hobby. It had already been a hobby for many years. And I like this idea of writing something as a hobby. Because hobbyists were people who bought this thing every month. Hobbyists were people who would buy a device like that and carry it around a campus. It was heavy. I had two batteries for it, too, because you need to switch batteries in the middle of a 45-minute class because you ran out. Um, and the great thing that when I downloaded the 30 floppies uh, of SLS, uh, Slackware didn't exist yet when I installed uh, Linux for the first time, I actually was able to patch Linux. I was able to change things. I changed Linux. I, I should have submitted them upstream. I'd actually be a copyright holder now, and they wouldn't be able to accuse me of not being a copyright holder. But uh, I never submitted my patches upstream. Um, by the way, the, one of the patches I made, the, the, uh, did you know that there was no, that there was, you fight over init and system D, but there was no init system in the early Linux. When you hit control to delete, it literally called halt in the source code. Um, I commented that out, so in case I hit control to delete, I didn't want the computer to halt. Um, so I got the patch, right? So I discovered CopyLeft because of this. I started using free software and started using Emacs as well and, and saw a copy of the GPL. Uh, now, this definition of copy left didn't exist at the time when I discovered it, but it's a really good definition. So you have the benefit of the years of people honing uh, this definition, which originally comes from, Wikip from Wikipedia and now is on copyleft.org. But the most important word I want to draw to your attention is strategy. Copy left is not a principle. It's a strategy. It's not a moral imperative, as Kant might say. It is a method to achieve an important moral imperative. That's the moral imperative from my point of view. Making sure that every individual who has software on their computer has the right to copy, modify, distribute, and install those modifications on their laptop or whatever hardware they have and share them with other people, that's, in my view, something that should be an inalienable right. I think it should be in the UN Declaration of Human Rights, in fact. Copyleft, on the other hand, is not a principle like that is. It is a strategy that we invented, particularly Stallman invented, uh, to help us get there to that moral imperative, help us reach that goal. So since it's only a strategy, it's not a principle. You can throw away strategies and make up new ones. You should be very careful about throwing away principles, particularly first principles. But we can ask the question if copyleft is working at all. People keep asking me that over and over again, in fact. So I, have, I find myself answering it very often. I'm pretty sure the only way we can answer it requires us to have access to multiple parallel universes, one of which all the software was, free software was copylefted, and all the software in the other universe was non-copylefted. If we could look at those two parallel universes, we could figure out what the better strategy was. 
But even if this, you know, the many worlds of quantum states, whatever that is, uh, is true, I only know it from science fiction. I'm not actually, uh, I didn't take any physics. I was busy taking literature and uh, philosophy. I think we can't analyze the parallel universes. So we have to look at what we have, what's happened in the past and what seems to be happening now. And as we do that, there are two things that are happening more and more these days. It's reached, I think, in our entire political culture, not just the free software one, quite a crescendo in recent years, months, and weeks, and days. There's a lot of truthiness. I love this word. It was a word invented by a US comedian named Stephen Colbert. And the word basically means something that has no evidence of whether it's true or not, but it sounds if it's, as if it's true has the quality of possibly being true, and therefore is easily believed when expressed over and over again. Um, it's what uh, Noam Chomsky calls concision, this idea that if you can state an idea briefly because it's fitting with ideas people already have, you're more likely to convince them over to your argument because you're basically just reinforcing their confirmation bias. Whereas if you want to explain something complicated that might have a lot of ins, a lot of outs, you need more time. What also happens is there's a lot of revisionist history happening with regard to copyleft. Here's an interesting example. David Woodhouse, who is a Linux developer, he's part of our coalition who enforced the GPL with us, asked this question of Greg Cage. And Greg said that he does want to see compliance with the GPL. I think Greg and I have always agreed about that. But he thinks suing them is the, suing any violator is the wrong answer because we've been so successful without, without ever suing anybody. That's a bit of revisionist history. We've been enforcing the GPL for a very long time, and not just on BusyBox, which is probably what I'm better known for being related with. It's been on Linux since the advent of the embedded system. This thing came out. It ran Linux. It had no source code offer. Source code was not available. And in the spring of 2003, a coalition of developers, whom I helped, particularly I helped Eric Anderson, but also involved with Howard Belta, we all did a GPL enforcement action that took about 10 to 12 months to accomplish. At the end of it, we not only got source code, we created a free software community. If you go back, if you find the old SV entry of OpenWRT, you will see the first check-in. It matches almost byte for byte what we were able to achieve from Cisco and Linksys as the compliant source release for that device. That community is still vibrant today. Admittedly, it has a fork at the moment, but both sides of the fork owe this action, this specific enforcement action, for all their history. I don't know how, many code got, how, how much code got upstreamed from OpenWRT. There's a lot of upstream crossover now, but I don't expect that revision one had tons of upstreamable code. But it was incredibly important not just for every, w, not every WRT54G owner, but for everyone who has ever installed an alternative firmware on the router ever in their life. They owe it in some part to this GPL enforcement action. Now, Rob Landley, who I worked with quite a bit on GPL enforcement for a while, uh, he's against GPL enforcement now quite publicly. Um, he even used, uh, he's recently publicly said that uh, he used some of the funds he got from GPL enforcement to fund a non-copyleft replacement to BusyBox. Um, I think that's great, actually. I think it's good to write more free software, whatever license it's under. But his main complaint was that in all the enforcement he and I did together, I never gave him a single upstream patch, patch to BusyBox, which is true. And I had the good opportunity to see Rob at Linux Conf Australia just last week, and we settled this issue. And I think we now understand each other. I never thought that upstreaming code was the top priority because I don't think it is the top priority of the GPL. The top priority of the GPL and its primary goal is to make sure downstream users who wish to be developers, either knowing it or not, i.e., they're going to serendipitously become a developer or they already want to be, have the code to the device in their hands and can make actual real use of that source code to build a new binary. And then over time, as happened with OpenWRT and now the lead project, also become upstream developers. So it's not a, 
immediacy of getting upstream code. It's about developing and building a community of upstream and downstream who slowly and, well, and, and work well together over time and expand because of the code promulgating under copyleft. That's why GPLv2, even GPLv2, common misconception, and people think this kind of language is only in v3. It's right there in v2. Compilation and installation matter. They really, really matter. They mattered when I had my PC, when this was the standard version of GPL, and it matters even more now. In the same conversation, this is what Matthew Garrett had to say about it. He put it better than I did, I think. This is what it's really about. It was certainly what it was about for me. Certainly, I had that thing at 19, and I was doing what Matthew's talking about here. Now, the kids today, as we old people say, won't have one of these, but they're going to have this, and it's going to be running Linux. And they probably won't right now have the source code for it. And they'll have one of these. They probably already do. That's running Android, which is Linux underneath. And they probably don't have the source code for it. And now the refrigerator is going to have Linux. We used to talk back in those CompOS Minix days that eventually your toaster will run Linux. It was a joke then, but it's not so much of a joke now. The refrigerator is one step away now from toasters. And this thing, now I like TV most People in our community, it seems, don't like TV shows so much, uh, but some of us do. And your TV is probably running Linux if you have one. In fact, this is the first device that a lot of people are going to interact with. This one and that one are the first two devices they're going to see in their lives most of the time these days. And if they're running Linux, they might actually become a developer. But if they're running Linux and it's violating the GPL, which is the case right now, they won't have the opportunity to become a Linux developer. They will think of his devices as shut down. And we need enforcement to make sure that they can. Conservancy has filed exactly one busy box lawsuit against a number of defendants, one of whom was Samsung. And in fact, Samsung was violating the GPL, came into compliance, which is very good of them to do, and it spawned yet another community, like the OpenWRT community, not as big, not as many people have Samsung TVs as have wireless routers, but there is a vibrant community of people developing an alternative firmware for Samsung TVs. You can actually run an, a, your own DVR on an SD card on a Samsung TV using Samigo. That's the kind of innovation that happens when you have software freedom. Now, long ago when this all started, there wasn't tons of different markets, tons of different products running Linux. There were wireless routers, and there was a guy I just mentioned, Harold Velta. Harold, Ironic to say now, was really, really angry at me that I didn't push to sue Linksys and Cisco right away. And from 2004 to 2013, he went off and did his own enforcement because he thought the enforcement that Eric and I were doing on BusyBox was not good enough and that more lawsuits needed to be filed. And he filed a lot of them over the years. This is, of course, the timeline when Linux was rising. Lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit as Linux rises to be in every device in the world. So when people say that we've done so well without ever suing anyone with Linux, we didn't live in that particular quantum reality. I didn't anyway. Maybe I've crossed like Worf did in that episode, and you all remember a different history than I do. I don't know. But as far as I know, we didn't. I think, in fact, the GPL is a reason that Linux was successful. It's a reason it was more successful than the BSDs. Uh, and its enforcement was part of that. I think it's FUD to say that we don't need GPL enforcement. Because if lawsuits and GPL enforcement endanger Linux, they've been endangering it since 2002. So if this is the world that endangered Linux makes, I think it's OK. Not so bad. We have Linux in lots of lots of lots of devices. But meanwhile, compliance is more and more rare. Most devices on the market are violating the GPL. I used to keep count. I, I just have a giant email folder of all the ones people have emailed to the Conservancy. I, I couldn't even count them anymore. Um, I made a, about 
because eight, nine years ago, I made a bet with the world that I could find a GPL violation per day, per day for a year. I did that, of course. It got boring after like day like 80 or 90, but I, I did it. Um, and what's even bigger now is I'm talking a lot about Linux because that's sort of where the, 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 the political pressure and the political fight is happening. But it's not just about BusyBox and Linux. There's Samba in these devices. There's FFmpeg and whole bunches of other GPL software that people put the GPL on because they wanted software freedom for their users and they're not getting it. And it's not just about Linux. Now, we talk a lot about Linux, about the GPL, I think for the obvious reason, because it's a kernel, which means the center of something. So it's the center of the operating system. So it's the kernel, it's GPL, so it's obviously going to be the one that we talk about first. And it's in all these devices. And it's violating in all those devices. And plenty more as well. Harold Velta is kind of my hero. Um, I told him recently that I should have listened to him back in 2004. He was absolutely right. Um, and it's unfortunate that he's gotten busy with other things, which are really great projects, but he's not available to do enforcement at the moment. He wanted to get started again, but has not been able to find the time. So for the moment, with regard to Linux at least, and Samba as well, Conservancy is the only organization doing community-oriented enforcement. But what do I mean by community-oriented enforcement? We have a list of principles. These are not the first principles. These are sort of the principles that fall out from the first principle. Because if your goal is to get software freedom for users, there are certain ways that you have to do GPL enforcement to make sure that you're doing it in a principled way that feeds into that first principle. Now, these are principles that I followed for many, many years myself, but I, I'd never written them down. So when Karen started working the Software Freedom Conservancy, she suggested we actually write them down. And we actually codify them in a formal way and make a public process to allow people to comment. Now, people have not joined our public process. They sort of are complaining off to the side, and I hope they will join and talk about our principles, but I think they're pretty good. And the one that is most pertinent to the current political debate is this one. Because we've always said that lawsuits are really bad if you have to get to them, and you should try to avoid them. And we've avoided and avoided and avoided lawsuits in every case where we've had to file one. And because of that, the fact of the matter is Greg and I agree on almost everything about GPL compliance and enforcement. There's a tiny, tiny place where we don't agree. Very, very tiny. And it's on, I think, a relatively minor point. And this is how it goes. I asked Greg, if you have a GPL violator who's been violating for 10 years, they're completely savvy, they understand completely what their violation is, in fact, you've figured out that they had planned from the start to violate the GPL and try to get away with it, and they've told you to their face there's no way they're ever going to comply and just go away. I asked Greg, what should I do in that situation? He said, you should walk away. So what that means is the worst of the worst of wireless routers, people who actually try to make you know, sneaky little proprietary kernel modules that do weird network stuff, are the ones who will get away with violations. And the tablets that try to have proprietary video and all sorts of other device drivers in Linux that are not free will get away with it, because they're the ones that are going to stand firm and say, fine, sue us. And that TV, when somebody writes a DRM module for Linux and has to make it proprietary so the DRM actually works, they'll get away with it, because they're going to say, no, you'll have to sue us if you want us to liberate that code. So the worst, in that strategy, the worst of the worst violators, the ones who really, really planned to hurt the free software community, get away with it, and the ones who just made mistakes actually come into compliance. It seems a little backwards to me. Now, the fact of the matter is, it's companies who are most upset that there have been lawsuits about the GPL. It's company representatives saying, you're destabilizing our industry. They have destabilized their industry pretty well already. There are hundreds of lawsuits everywhere, every year between various tech companies, all the time. Uh, there's this th service called Pacer. It's actually free for your first 10 services. If you want to search the US legal system, you can search for companies and see, wow, there's all these lawsuits between them I never heard about. 
I tried to count earlier today. I, I went through every single lawsuit I could think of, and I counted many of them twice. Like, I counted our one busy box lawsuit against 15 defendants as 15. I was like, okay, call that 15, even though it was only one, because there was 15 defendants. If you count in the maximum possible way, I couldn't get past the mid-40s. And that's in the entire history of GPL enforcement, at least in the quantum reality I'm living in. So how is it that companies can be so angry at us that we filed 50 lawsuits when they filed thousands against each other? They continually to politically attack us. Even companies that have countersued for GPL themselves come back and attack us for violating the GPL. And specifically, they're really, really angry about Kristoff's case. And in that case, we're funding Kristoff to do what's right about his code on code he holds copyright on. The funny part is, is it's not just that side that's angry at me and Karen for doing enforcement. Our friends are mad at us, too, because of this one, this principle they don't like. This year, at renewal time for, uh, for conservancy supporters uh, who had joined last year, two donors wrote to us, and they said, both said pretty much the same thing, that, well, you're just not being aggressive enough. You should be getting so much money out of these companies that you're funding a giant operation to enforce and get everybody into compliance so everybody has the source code they deserve, and you're just not doing it right. You should be making them pay through the nose so you can roll the money forward and keep enforcing and keep enforcing. Now, we did a little bit of that. We got those defendants in that busy box lawsuit into compliance. And if you go and read, very, very transparent, you can see exactly how much money Conservancy took in from those lawsuits. And we did use some of that money to fund future GPL enforcement. But we've been doing this Linux enforcement for five years. And I'm slightly ashamed to say, in all the Linux enforcement I've done, I have not gotten a single company into compliance yet. I, we have matters open that I opened the day we got the first people signing up for our coalitions. Those matters are still open today. Karen, there's two emails you have to send on those, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're still working on those matters, Karen and I, after five years. And the reason is proprietary kernel modules. They come into compliance on all the easy stuff, right? They're like, oh yeah, well we have a, you know, we fixed our build system and now you can build the software and everything. And we say, that .ko file, is a combined work with Linux. You have to give us a source code to that. And they say, well, let's talk about all those other issues we're fixing. Let's talk about those for a little bit longer. We talk about, we dutifully say, well, we'll talk about those. Let's get, we'll, we'll put that aside. We'll talk about that last. Finally, we get to that being the only issue. And they don't, do, they don't come into compliance. Now, if we wanted to do what our allies are asking us, be more aggressive, I don't think we can in that scenario because of this principle. This principle is the most important one to me. I think it is complete corruption if you take a dime from a company who is still out of compliance. Because basically, you're at that point being paid off to look the other way. So I will not work for conservancy. I will resign the day we take a dime from a company that's in a vi an active violation. Um, but that also means I have to do this, which I hate doing. But if we're going to go this way, and we're going to say, let's never be corrupt, uh, let's never take money from anybody who's in active violation, then we have to ask you to donate. As was mentioned in the last talk in this room, there is a supporter match running. If you sign up as a supporter for Conservancy, the donation will be matched by an anonymous donor for the next week. So I hope you will do it. I also want to tell you that we don't like this work. It's not like I'm enjoying it. The, my political opponents who have attacked me and attacked Karen as well have kept saying that somehow we, you know, we, this is like we're trying to make our careers out of this. You don't make your careers out of something that's boring. In fact, my, at least my career is screwed. Like I can work two places for the rest of my life, at Software Freedom Conservancy or I can go back and work for the FSF. I guess I could go be like work at a coffee shop or something, but that's it because no one will hire me. So why would I do that to myself for any reason other than because I care about this community and I want to do good things for it? There's no other reason. I wouldn't bother. I'd love to be a developer again. I used to be a software developer. I used to be a sysadmin. I guess I, I would be antiquated because I don't say DevOps. I still say sysadmin, but whatever. Um, I would love to do that work again, but this is too important, and there's so few people doing it. It's what Harold did. Harold is a software developer, and he said, enforcement is boring and annoying, and I care about it, but I want to write new free software for the world. And he's writing some great new free software 
Uh, he's written an entire GSM stack that's completely free software. It's really amazing, but he doesn't want to do GPL enforcement. So it leaves people like me and Karen to pick up the slack. I was asked in my pre FOSDEM interview, which you can read online, uh, the conference organizers, uh, this wasn't really a question, they just sort of stated it, uh, but I took it as a question. I answered that as absolutely. I agree with this completely. I want every developer in this room to know, I, I want to live in a world where you would know if I put the GPL on my code, if I'm editing code that's under the GNU general public license or any of the similar licenses like the Afero GPL or LGPO, that my software is forever free. I want that to be true, but again, I don't live in that quantum reality. Copyleft is not magic pixie dust. We don't sprinkle it on code and clap our hands and suddenly it flies. That's not how it works. It's difficult to keep copyleft working. There's a back end process that you have to do. And we ha someone has to take care of that for Linux. Now, I care a great deal about both GPL and Linux, so it's strange that Karen and I have been accused of caring more about one than the other. Our critics have said, well, you care about more, you care about copyleft, you don't care what happens to Linux. It, it's as if they're saying we're going to sacrifice Linux for, you know, at, the, at the altar of the great GPL, as if GPL were a principle, not a strategy. The thing is, is Linux and GPL both are not as important as people think they are. And I, I'm probably going to get, that's going to be the little sound bite that my political opponents quote, but it's true, and I will say the truth. What matters about Linux is it's a community of people developing software. It's a community that has some bugs that need to be fixed. That's much more important than anything else in some ways um, about how they treat each other and so forth on their mailing list. But the key thing I think is valuable about Linux is that it's GPL then gets to the next generation in these devices who pick it up, start hacking on it, and then join that community and the community grows. That's the world that I wanted to live in. That's the world that excited me when I got that laptop in 1992, and that's the world I want to preserve. Really, code and licenses both are ephemeral. Um, I, maybe I'm too much of an academically trained computer scientist, but my professors always said the code doesn't matter. The ideas behind it, the ability to express com computation is what matters, and you rewrite code all the time. Linux is being rewritten from the ground up inside the Linux project dozens of times over the years. And the long-term freedom matters, long-term freedom matters more. Making sure that everybody has the right to copy, share, and modify the software that they have today matters more than what happened yesterday or what happens tomorrow. And making sure that they can do it in perpetuity is what GPL is designed to do matters. I want to make sure new developers can hack their devices. That's the most important thing to me. Um, and I want them to be able to join the communities that don't require proprietary software to join them. That's the world I'm trying to create. Linux is an excellent project to do that with. The GPL is an excellent license to do that with. But we can't mix up the principle with the specifics of success of one particular project under one particular brand. Conservancy is actually really just an agency for all of you. We don't do anything unless developers ask us to do it. That's true in our conference organizing work. We don't organize random conferences. We organize conferences that developers ask us to organize. And it's true in our GPL enforcement work. We do it because developers came to us and said, I would like you to enforce my copyrights for me. So the future of GPL, the future of copyleft as a strategy, does not really rest with conservancy at all. It rests with those of you that write GPL code, those of you that generate copyrights, assuming you're actually generating your own copyrights. This is happening in pretty much every, it's not just Linux, it's happening in pretty much every project except for Samba. Which ha because Samba has a policy that developers should be allowed to keep their own copyrights and it's preferred for the developers to have their own copyrights. And if you want to contribute to the project, you have to get an agreement from your employer to, that you can do so. Most other projects don't work that way. And over time, companies have moved to the top and things like Unknown and None, which it's pretty mean to tell, call independent developers. It really should say independent developers there. Because um, that's who that probably is, as is consultant and this unknown and so forth. Everything else is companies. There, are comp there is at least one company up there whom, when I met with a person in their open source division, told me, you will have to keep watching my company forever. Their plan is to violate every time you're not looking. 
and that company is on that list. So if we're in that world, if those com kind of companies are holding the copyrights of Linux, they can disarm copyleft with a stroke of a pen eventually once they get all the copyrights everywhere. So what's most important for the future of copyleft is for people to keep their own copyrights, which is a position that key Linux developers believe deeply in. Linus has always kept his own copyrights. Greg KH keeps his own copyrights. James Bottomley posted to a mailing list recently saying that he has done as much as he can in his career to make sure that he and other developers can keep their own copyrights. I had a conversation with Linus, and he told me, actually, I, when I know you, you used to work for the FSF, and you do that copyright assignment. I'm against that stuff. Every developer should have the right to choose for himself or herself, well, he just said himself, um, what license they get to put their software under, and how it's enforced, and when it's enforced, and who helps them with enforcement. That was stated to me by Linus as a principle of his. And I pretty much agree about that. I think Karen and I both agree about that. And that's why we do what we do, because developers who do hold their own copyrights have come to us and asked us to be the who, why, and when, and where of their GPL enforcement efforts. And the nice part about that is it's a very transparent regulatory mechanism. Eventually, if everybody's angry at how we're doing enforcement, we will dismantle the project because everybody will leave. And if it grows because people join, it will grow. The interesting thing about all this is as these politics got worse, we actually went to our coalitions and said, maybe this is too politically unviable. Maybe you don't want to do this anymore. And they rather vehemently said, no, please do not stop. Keep going. Keep going. This is important for me because that's why I put GPL on my code. Ironically, that's what's caused this battleground. And that battleground was created by the people that oppose the GPL. I, I wish I was as good as a politician as they are some days. I'm just too honest, I think. We're only going to do what our projects ask us to do. And enforcement, again, I say, is just one of the many things we do to advance software freedom. We worry about logistics of projects. We run conferences. And pretty much anything that comes along that we think is going to impede software freedom, if our projects are feeling strongly about it, we feel strongly about it, too. That's why Conservancy last week made this statement. This is actually just an excerpt. The full statement's online. Uh, I don't think we can stand silent in the current climate. As somebody from the US coming to Europe, um, I felt an obligation to put this on a slide and let you know that we are concerned as an organization because these kinds of larger global politics impact our ability to share free software with each other. You know, it's weird living in the US. Uh, I was born there. I grew up there. I, you know, it's, it's hard to leave your home, so I, you know, I really didn't even consider leaving. Uh, besides, you don't want me to leave because that, you, know, <laughs> you can guess that I didn't vote for Trump, so that's one less <laughs> person there that's going to vote for somebody else. Um, so uh, the politics of it are, are, are sort of, I think politics have a way of seeping into everything. And I think that the global politics, the truthiness, the revisionist history, it has seeped its way in. And, and I see this weird thing happening. Karen mostly, but I as well, in some conferences have been running these compliance feedback sessions where we ask developers to come and tell us what we're doing wrong. We hear all this vitriol about what we're doing constantly from company representatives. We figure, well, are the developers mad too? They tell us the developers are mad. We should ask them. And the responses are, are, are basically almost overwhelming and positive. They have these little tiny tweaks. Like most developers, they want to come and sort of tweak the system and be like, well, if you did this slightly differently, wouldn't that work better? Uh, but other than that, they're just giving us positive feedback and saying we're doing a good job. And meanwhile, we get these constant criticisms coming at us in all sorts of different kind of sneaky political ways. People do sneaky political things to come after us all the time. I don't know why they're doing it. I'm truly baffled. I'm truly baffled. My best guess is that they're actually afraid that you'll all figure out that you're actually in control. I often say, that if every single software developer woke up in the world, woke up tomorrow and said, I will never write a line of proprietary software code again, the free software movement would win overnight. 
Now, it's a silly example because that's not going to happen, but it goes to my point that each developer individually has a linear incremental influence on what happens to software freedom. So you're going to have to get your control back. The most important thing you can do is go to your employer and tell them you want to keep your own copyrights. You should decide your licensing strategy. I don't even care if you all go and do that and say, I'm going to use the ISC license. I think developers should be in control of which free software license they pick, not companies. But if free software is going to succeed, it's going to be dependent on developers being in control of policy, not just code. Companies will trick you. They've, they understand what we do. And they will give you lots of exciting technical problems to distract you from policy. Work on the technical problems, but don't forget about the policy while you do it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I know the university needs us to leave quickly. Do we have time for questions, Wolfram? Yes, I think we have a time for a few questions. I'll pack up during questions so we can get out of here quickly. So if uh, brevity is a gift, I know this is a topic where it's tempting to uh, present your opinion, but please try to, to focus on, on the question so we can have lots of questions. And if you leave the room, please do so quietly. So we have two microphones, and I will start here. Thank you for the talk. When you were discussing the business of not taking money from companies to overlook violations, which, yay, um, you then went straight to, therefore I have to ask for contributions to the SFC, which struck me as a bit of a false dichotomy. It seems to overlook the question of costs awards. Um, could you I'm, I'm briefly sorry, discuss so that? Noise in the room. What was the last thing you said? It seems to overlook the issue of costs awards. Could you discuss briefly whether you think those have any role to play in making violators pay for being sued? Oh, I, I think that it's absolutely reasonable, and we wrote the principles very, uh, very carefully. Mike. 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 My battery is dead. Can I have that mic? So I think that um, we were very careful in directing the principles to say that monetary gain shouldn't be a priority and you shouldn't take money from somebody who's still violating. But we do, uh, in our enforcement actions, ask for them to cover the costs of compliance uh, that, they, that they incurred. And in the BusyBox lawsuit, you can go read our Form 990s and see that we received money uh, from those violators because they were fully in compliance. The weird situation we have now is that, uh, and this is what I said in my LCA talk in 2016 that everybody attacked me for, but the fact of the matter is, is the only way we're going to get any of these Linux violators into compliance is probably to sue them because they keep saying, we will not release the source code of that proprietary module for years and years and years, which is exactly what VMware did, which is exactly why Christoph had to sue them. And that case is still pending. I, I'd hope that the German system would be faster than the US. It's turning out that it kind of isn't. Uh, it's taking just as long as US cases tend to take, so we have to wait for the courts to deal with it. And while that's happening, uh, we have to keep funding it, and I hope you'll donate. <laughs> it's up here, the next question. Uh, here. Oh, so uh, I see you. Hi, my name is Peter Senachudin, and I am a kernel developer. And what you do in situations in which you have a developer that simply completely disagree with you, I don't feel that you represent my interests as a kernel developer. What, what you do in situations like that? And I consider myself a community guy. So it's, I, what you do in situations like that? I'm not, I'm not defending that companies are good or anything. From the community perspective, you simply don't represent me. So what's your take on that? You're saying you don't feel conservancy represents your views? Exactly. Yeah. I, I, so you shouldn't sign one of our enforcement agreements. They are public online. You can read them. You should tell people why you don't agree with us. You should tell us why you don't agree with us, and maybe we should change our behavior uh, so that you could. Um, I think the most important thing is that you are in control as a developer, whether you agree with me or not. Right? And suppose you're like a BSD developer, which means you probably disagree with me about a lot of things. Um, I think if you're a BSD developer, you should have your own copyrights too and license them under the BSD license because that's what you believe in. Um, that's what I think is most important in all this. Um, and that's important as a meta strategy, right? I talked about how copyleft is just a strategy. Well, uh, it's important that 
we try all the strategy at once, including licensing things under non-copyleft licenses and a whole host of other things. But I really put my face in develop face faith in developers. Developers are the people that created this community, and they understand it, and they care about what happens to their software for their users. So I want you in charge of that decision-making process, not some corporate lawyer. Over here. Ah, got it. Um, so I'm, I'm one of those people who thinks you should be more aggressive. Um, yeah, but I heard you donated anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you say on your slides, you know, the um, GPL2 projects, you know, violators should get the benefit of GPL v3 like termination clauses. Mm -hmm. um, Personally, I wouldn't even go that far. I think they should be encouraged to switch to GPL3 because the GPL2's <laughs> termination clauses are terrifying. Um, but if you don't want to go that far, you could give them the benefit of something very like the GPL3 termination clauses come into compliance within 60 days. Otherwise, well, in that case, when you have come into compliance, we will need a fat wadge of cash as well to restore your rights. And I think that's roughly what happened with the BusyBox lawsuits that Conservancy did. Um, we, I wouldn't say we asked for a, f quote, fat wad of cash, unquote, as you put it. Um, I think we asked for our costs to be covered reasonably and, uh, and making sure that we had a sustainable model. I, I believed at that time we could make a sustainable model, but I didn't, I, I basically underestimated uh, when I was doing this before Karen worked with us, uh, that, that these Linux violators would be so strident and ready to basically go to court. I'm, I'm amazed to this day that VMware just didn't remove the Linux code. They're trying to do it now uh, for the new products, but not the old ones. But they could rewrite their kernel such that they took all Linux code out. It is possible to comply with the GPL just by not incorporating the code that's GPL'd anymore. They don't have to release VM kernel. They can remove the GPL'd stuff from VM kernel. Why they didn't do that for the years that people were complaining to them that they had violated, I don't know. I, don't, I truly don't understand it. It's bizarre to me. Um, I, and, and so because of that situation, it means that there's not revenue coming in because I'm not going to take a dime from any of those companies. I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. I, I don't think Karen would agree to that either, right? So up here, very up here. Yep. So I was wondering if you are able to attract people who, are, who don't have a, um, a software background, but have a legal background, so you can um, sort of uh, bring people into the conservancy, conservancy, what is it, foundation? Yeah, conservancy, software freedom conservancy, yeah. Yeah, uh, so are you able to bring in uh, fresh blood with uh, more of a legal background than a software background? Half of, half of our staff have, we have a staff of four and half of them have law degrees, so I think we've been successful in that. Karen, and Karen is one of them. But yeah, there aren't many lawyers who will work for nonprofit wages, though. A lot of people go to law school to get rich. That's a fact of, uh, fact of life. And so, you, and that's another thing you can see in our form knowledge. You can see how much we get paid as well. You will notice that we do not get paid as much as law firm lawyers by far. Where, where, where? Sorry. Uh, does the Software Freedom Conservancy uh, maintain a list of active violations and companies that violate the GPL so that consumers can look at it and say, I don't want to buy products from those vendors anymore? So that's very similar to what uh, Eric Anderson once maintained called the Hall of Shame for BusyBox. Um, one of our principles you might have noticed is this idea of uh, maintaining confidentiality. Now that particular principle has been criticized. Um, I think that that principle is important because it is still true that while the most strident violators are these ones with these proprietary Linux modules, the overwhelming majority of violators often have no clue that GPL software is in their product. So going and publicly shaming them doesn't seem right to me. Um, I would rather work with them to get in compliance. And so we have looked at the idea of trying to get community members involved to help those types of companies that are likely to be responsive to engineers. But there are very few people that can do that. And it also has a public shaming aspect if we run that as an individual project. OK. Uh, uh, they want to give me the next question, sorry. 
Here yeah. it will be the last questions. I think you will okay. be available. I can talk to you later. To hallway talks if, if yeah. you can be found tomorrow. So here, last question. Yeah. Thank you. So this is a question about paragraph two of the GPLv2. Um, <laughs> if, if I were to distribute Wait, a phone. subsection, please? <laughs> the, the, the final paragraph, the unknown. Uh, the, 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 fi the, the final, the final, the final paragraphs, the three final paragraphs after oh, you the number sections. You mean the penultimate? The I know the penultimate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yes. an important paragraph. Go ahead. It is, that it is. So if, if I were to distribute a phone with a GPL2 app in user space, is that phone a whole work or is that phone a volume storage medium? So the GPL doesn't decide that in, in a sense. That is a question of the copyright regime you're operating under. Never forget that GPL is a copyright license, which means it operates under the copyright law in the jurisdiction you're in uh, when you go to act about it. And that was by design. It's what is called, Stallman called strong copyleft. So the goal was, uh, I, I, either Jeremy or Michael Meeks invented this phrase, I'm not sure which. It's the judo move of copyleft. It takes the force of copyright and says, I'm gonna push back with maximum force using that force against itself. And so it's trying to get as far as copyright law goes, and as copyright law expands, i.e. declares more things derivative works, then, of course, GPL will cover those things as combined or derivative works, or works, or as GPLv2 puts it, works based on the program. So I can't answer that question. I, uh, everybody always asks it, and that's the, the phrase that makes people angry. It makes corporate lawyers angry, because their, their anger is, well, you won't tell us what we're allowed to make proprietary. We, you're going to wait for the court to do that. That creates uncertainty, et cetera, et cetera. That was how it was designed in 1988. That was the plan from the start. And my glib answer is always, if you're not sure, make everything you do free software. Or don't put any GPL software in it. You can always do that. That's the classic place where I clash with a lot of people because I still believe what Stallman said about this, which was, if you want your software to be maximally popular, use a non-copyleft license. If you wanted to maximally defend freedom, use the strongest copyleft license available. So it's a trade-off, right? I know people are gonna be afraid from that issue you raise and say, oh my gosh, I can't do this. And I know it's painful if you work in a company where you're trying to get free software adopted. But remember that GPL was designed to defend your freedom. And the conversation you're actually having is, how much freedom can we take away? Please tell us. And you say, you're not allowed to take away any freedom. But can't we take away a little bit of freedom? Well, uh, you'll have to ask a lawyer. Why should we have to ask a lawyer how much freedom we should take away? You should tell us how much we can oppress you. Don't fall into that trap. I'm, I'm happy to take more questions. You'll find me tomorrow either in the Conservancy booth in H or across the hall in the legal and policy dev room also in H.